Immediately after the White Star Line's Majestic was completed in 1890, the company was preparing to order its next ship. In 1892, the Cunard Line launched its newest ship, RMS Campania. Campania and her sister, Lucania, were the largest and fastest ships in the world. White Star Line observed the performance of its rival company's two ships. Campania and Lucania were immensely popular, but these ships did both suffer from intense vibrations, causing some discomfort to her passengers. White Star, not unfamiliar with vibration itself, was determined to avoid this flaw on their newest ship. To ensure that there would be no vibration, the new ship would be designed with a moderate service speed of 21 knots. While a 21 knot service speed would not put White Star's ship in the running for the transatlantic speed record, it would allow for a 6 day crossing time. Anything beyond that, the company figured, would be frivolous and presented a higher risk of vibration. Not to mention, it would make the ship less economical, both due to the extra space required for the larger engines and due to higher fuel consumption. The design for the new ship was completed in 1897, and the keel was quickly laid down at Harland & Wolf in March of that year. This new ship would be called Oceanic, the second ship in White Star history to hold that name, and would consist of four structural decks, two superstructure decks, and a double bottom. She would not have a double hull, but was sturdily built, and by one metric would be 11% stronger than her rival Campania, partly owing to the subsidies by the British government to ensure that the ship would meet admiralty requirements in the event that she was needed for war. Oceanic was fully framed by January 1898, fully plated by July 1898, and launched in January 1899, with a crowd of as many as 8,000 spectators. Oceanic was painted a light gray for the launch to allow for better photographs and subsequent publicity. After the launch, Oceanic was towed to the Alexandra Graving Dock, where she, like many ships before and after her, was fitted out. This is when Oceanic became the ship that her future passengers would come to love. First class accommodations were amidships and spread out over four decks. The promenade deck, of course, included the promenade, which was entirely reserved for first class, and wrapped around the ornate and spacious library in some of the premium first class cabins. Unlike future White Star ships, Oceanic did not have any grand first class suites. The deck below, the upper deck, was named such because it was the uppermost deck of the structural hull of the ship. On Oceanic, it contained the first class smoking room, barber shop, plentiful public bathrooms, the inquiry office, and first class cabins forward. The smoking room was lit partially by the large and finely detailed glass skylight above, which included mechanisms for ventilation so that a cloud of smoke would not form at the ceiling. The saloon deck, right below the upper deck, is where the first class dining saloon was situated. I refrain from calling it a dining room because in Oceanic's early years it was set up like a traditional dining saloon with long tables and swivel chairs. In this way and many others, Oceanic was caught in the middle of the transition from liners that felt like ships and liners that felt more like palaces. Nonetheless, the dining saloon was multiple decks high in the center, and it too was lit by a large glass dome surrounded by detailed carvings on all four sides, symbolizing Great Britain, the United States, Liverpool, and New York. And on the main deck, there were additional first class cabins. Let's move on to the second class. Second class was the smallest on board, and was confined to the after end of the ship. The highest section of second class was technically on the promenade deck, but within a superstructure island near the stern. This small and isolated part of the ship is where the second class library and smoke room were. Despite their size, these rooms were well decorated and comfortable, just not to the same degree as in first class. The two decks below contained the second class cabins and dining saloon. Finally, third class, which had accommodation for the greatest number of people, was situated primarily on the lowermost passenger deck. By this time, steerage was on its way out, so most third class passengers had enclosed cabins. Still, there was segregation among the third class passengers. Single men who slept in open bunks were forward, married couples and families were amidships, and single women were aft. This was the traditional arrangement on White Star Line ships, and it had proven itself effective in mitigating social problems on board. Third class accommodations were what you might expect, bare and plain. It was nothing to write home about, but those passengers who may have experienced steerage on different voyages would have been grateful for the fact that the space was clean, well lit, and well ventilated. Finally, a few notes about accommodations for the officers aboard Oceanic. Unlike on other ships, there was no boat deck, but rather a navigational deck, from which passengers were restricted. 
Yes, the lifeboats were stored here, but unless there was an emergency, the topmost deck on Oceanic was reserved for officers. Here were the quarters, shared spaces, and of course, access to the bridge, which was actually higher than the navigational deck itself. All the way forward, immediately below the bridge, were the captain's quarters, which were similar to a typical first-class cabin, but a little bit larger. The captain had a desk, a large table, and four windows overlooking the bow. Oceanic was finally delivered to the White Star Line in August 1899. She was 17,273 gross registered tons and commanded a lot of fanfare among the press and the public. In fact, a speculative and sensational press had been pumping up Oceanic since she was ordered. So it should come as no surprise that the maiden voyage was a tremendous success. Oceanic was to serve on the Liverpool to Queenstown to New York route. By the time she entered the open Atlantic after leaving Queenstown in early September 1899, she was carrying 383 first, 244 second, and 829 third class passengers for a total of 1,456. First class, expectedly, was practically full as wealthy passengers returned from their summers in Europe. One of those in first class was chairman of the shipyard which built her, Lord Peary. It was common for company officials of both the shipping line and the shipbuilder to sail on the maiden voyage to ensure that all was running smoothly, and this was no exception. Oceanic was under the command of her first captain, John Cameron, who would remain with her for many years to come. And Oceanic had displaced many officers and crew from other ships, including Captain Edward Smith's Majestic, who lost her chief officer and chief engineer to the new flagship. The maiden voyage had gone as smoothly as one could hope for, until the ship arrived in New York on September 13th. The pilot struggled to board the ship once it was discovered that the ladder was not long enough to reach Oceanic's bulwarks. Instead, a gangway door on a lower deck had to be opened for him. Hundreds of people were at the pier waiting to welcome the largest ship in the world, and not long after the ship docked in Manhattan, an impressive steam yacht named Corsair came up alongside the Oceanic. It was carrying a man who had his eye on Oceanic and the White Star Line, John Pierpont Morgan. Morgan must have been pleased, because the reviews were in and there wasn't a negative thing to be said about Oceanic. Passengers described the voyage fondly, but the weather had been fine, so that was to be expected. More telling was the praise of the ship's crew. Both Captain Cameron and Thomas Andrews of Harland and Wolfe expressed their utmost satisfaction with Oceanic. The engines must have performed well, as Chief Engineer Sewell stated that, She has exceeded my most sanguine expectations. These optimistic words proved to be true. Oceanic was noted by passengers, including the rich and famous, to be comfortable at sea, timely, and reliable. As such, she tended to sail relatively full in any given season. Even in the following year, when shipping lines across the world struggled to sign on sufficient firemen, and as such had to run their ships at lower speeds, White Star prioritized Oceanic so that she did not have to slow down much and could maintain her reputation for reliability. Carrying an average of 25,000 passengers per year, she was the most popular ship on the Atlantic, surpassing even Cunard's beloved Campania and Lucania. Navigating the Atlantic, though, was still dangerous business, and Oceanic was not immune from the risks. On August 7, 1901, Oceanic left Liverpool for Queenstown. At around half past midnight, in the vicinity of Tusker Lighthouse, the onset of haze began to diminish visibility. Captain Cameron activated the automatic whistle, which would sound the whistle once every 60 seconds. Six minutes later, he put the engine room on standby. Five minutes after that, he ordered the engines reduced to half speed ahead. The third officer and a lookout were stationed at the ship's stem, and the two lookouts in the crow's nest remained on high alert. The engines were slowed to 25 revolutions per minute, which was approximately the minimum in order to keep the engines continuously running. The heavy 2.5 knot current against the ship also helped to slow her down. Just past 0100, 3rd Officer Stokes Smith called out to the bridge with a megaphone that he had heard the whistle of another ship. Captain Cameron on the bridge ordered the helm hard aport to turn the ship to starboard and telegraphed the engine room to put the engines full speed astern. Much lower in the water, the crew of a small Irish steamer named Kinkora spotted a towering oceanic on course to T-bone their ship. Kinkora had reportedly slowed down to two knots, while Oceanic, running at full speed astern against the two and a half knot current, was nearing a standstill. But it was too late. Oceanic sliced into Kinkora. Aboard Oceanic, Cameron ordered two lifeboats lowered immediately. Lifelines were tossed from the Oceanic's bow. 
Cameron recognized that the little steamer was doomed, but he kept Oceanic's bow wedged into her hull to prop the steamer up to give anyone on board enough time to escape. Then he had the engines put to slow astern to pull his ship out of the hull of the other, and sure enough, the smaller ship went straight to the bottom. Fourteen men were rescued from Concora, but seven lost their lives. Oceanic made way for Queenstown, and her first-class passengers raised 160 pounds for the widows of the deceased men of Concora. The damage to Oceanic was so minimal that she was deemed in fine enough condition to continue on to New York by the next afternoon. The courts later assigned blame to both Kinkora and Oceanic for failing to take proper precautions given the near-zero visibility. White Star appealed the decision twice, but to no avail. But clearly White Star Line was adamant that Cameron took the proper actions and he retained his command of Oceanic. Given Oceanic's popularity and commercial success, White Star was planning to build a sister ship to be named Olympic. But in May 1902, White Star Line's shareholders agreed to sell the company to the International Mercantile Marine Company, an American company owned by the very J.P. Morgan who visited Oceanic in New York on her maiden voyage. With the future of the company up in the air, and three expensive ships, Cedric, Baltic, and Adriatic, already on order with Harland and Wolfe, the plan for Oceanic's sister ship was put on hold indefinitely. Indeed, it would never become a reality. But Oceanic continued on her way. She, along with many other White Star Line ships, was transferred from Liverpool to Southampton in 1907. There were a few strategic reasons for this move, but those were of no concern to the crew, many of whom quit on the spot due to the difficulty of traveling from their homes to Southampton. As a result, Oceanic sailed in May 1907 with a bare-bones crew, and when a new crew was signed on, it still took a long time for the ship to return to her normal efficiency as new hires warmed up to the new ship. Labor tensions were a constant strain on shipping companies. On June 3, 1907, a fire was discovered in the aftermost section of third class while the ship was docked in New York. The fire was safely put out, but resulted in about $10,000 worth of damage, and it is speculated that the fire was started intentionally by striking dock workers. Nonetheless, Oceanic sailed from New York two days later, albeit with the affected section of third class empty. Captain John Cameron was replaced by Captain Herbert Haddock, and Oceanic continued her commercially successful career. Over the next few years, though, Oceanic did experience a string of nearly disastrous events. January 6, 1909. Oceanic was approaching New York in the midst of thick fog when she stopped her engines. When the fog lifted, it was revealed that the Nantucket lightship was a mere two ship lengths dead ahead. This event, of course, foreshadowed Olympic's fatal collision with the Nantucket lightship 25 years later. March 21st, 1911. Oceanic was mid-Atlantic when her foremast was struck by lightning, shearing off the top of the mast and knocking out the ship's wireless. She arrived in New York days later with a different profile, but otherwise unharmed. April 10, 1912. Oceanic was involved in Titanic's close call with SS New York while she was leaving Southampton. Tied up to the SS New York herself, Oceanic could well have been pulled from her mooring too. If she had, maybe Titanic would not have continued on her maiden voyage. August 5, 1912. Oceanic's port engine broke down and the ship's westbound crossing was delayed six hours while the necessary repairs were made at sea, contributing to Oceanic's slowly losing her reputation for ultimate reliability. February 5th, 1914. Oceanic was westbound in heavy seas when she took a wave the wrong way, the wave washing over the promenade deck and sweeping passengers away, but thankfully not overboard. Some first class rooms were flooded. There was one more event of note that I didn't mention. In March 1912, James Moody wrote a letter to his aunt which included an explanation that it was supposed to be Olympic, Titanic, and Oceanic servicing the Southampton to New York route for the White Star Line once Titanic was ready. He wrote this not knowing that, in two months' time, Oceanic herself would come to a stop in the middle of the Atlantic to pick up a drifting lifeboat of the lost Titanic. Oceanic's captain wrote in the log, Three bodies were found in the boat but being decomposed and unfit for removal, these same were committed to the deep, from the boat, service being read by Dr. French. Ship proceeded at 2.27 p.m., having taken aboard collapsible boat, which is marked number one deck lifeboat, certified by Board of Trade to carry 47 persons. Oceanic was mid-Atlantic when World War I commenced on July 28, 1914. She continued her eastbound crossing with her watertight doors closed and lights turned out. There were Germans aboard, but there was apparently no conflict between passengers. 
When Oceanic arrived in Southampton, she was met by Royal Navy officials who took over the ship. Before long, RMS Oceanic would become HMS Oceanic and join her fleet mates Mauritania and Aquitania as an experimental armed merchant cruiser. The ship was manned by a crew of 439, including 49 officers. Many of Oceanic's civilian crew stayed with the ship after she was handed over to the Royal Navy and Captain William Slater. Among these men was Charles Lighttoller, senior surviving officer of the Titanic disaster. Once the ship was converted, she left port with a sealed envelope containing her orders not to be opened until the ship was out of port. Once the ship dropped off its pilot, Captain Slater opened the sealed orders. The orders were to head for Scapa Flow and meet up with the HMS Crescent. Once in Scapa Flow, Oceanic began patrolling the area. In one incident, she signaled for another steamer to stop. When the unidentified steamer didn't heed the warning, Oceanic fired a shot across the bow of the ship, which, of course, then stopped immediately. Once identified, the ship too was allowed to proceed. Oceanic left Scapa Flow and went to Muckle Flugga, and then even further north to the Faroe Islands. On September 7, 1914, Oceanic was running a north-south patrol line between the Shetland Islands and Orkney Islands. She had stopped a few ships that day, but it was now around midnight and fog was setting in. When the fog lifted, Oceana continued her patrol, but instead of turning back to the south, the ship, for reasons not fully understood, mistakenly headed east. She sailed on this course for an hour and a half at 8 knots. At around 0515, believing the ship to be at the southern end of its patrol line, Captain Slater had the ship turned to a northerly heading. Because of the earlier and still unrecognized mistake, Oceanic was now headed for the water between Fula and the mainland. Around 0700, Oceanic turned to the west. Soon, land was sighted off the starboard bow, which is likely when the crew knew that there was a problem. Captain Slater ordered a 15-point turn, essentially turning the ship around to get it out of the area as soon as possible. But the ship was already in dangerous waters and struck rocks within minutes. Once the damage was assessed, it was clear that the ship would be lost. Even if the crew managed to get her off the rocks, she would have inevitably sunk. Over the following weeks, the crew salvaged what they could from the ship. Charles Lightoller wrote in his memoir that it was difficult for him to hear the grinding and moaning of his favorite ship during her slow and painful death. The fact that it took a storm to finally break up the ship after she had been twisted by the sea for a month is a testament to the structural integrity with which the ship was built. Oceanic's loss contributed to the realization that large passenger liners were not well suited for duty as armed merchant cruisers, and ocean liners were soon relegated to duties as troop ships and hospital ships moving forward. After long negotiations, the British government agreed to pay compensation of £310,000 for the loss of White Star Line's beloved and unique Oceanic.